Uh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the LSE for this evening's event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Charlie Bean, uh, currently Professor of Economics at the LSE, uh, but I used to be Deputy Governor uh, at the uh, Bank of England, where I had uh, a considerable amount of interaction uh, with our speaker tonight. Uh, who is, as you'll be well aware, uh, Dr. Patrick Honohan, uh, whose career has spanned the worlds of academia and policy. Uh, he's a graduate of University College Dublin uh, and earned a PhD in economics from this august institution in 1978. Uh, he subsequently taught economics at the LSE, the University of California, San Diego, uh, Australian National University, uh, and University and Trinity Colleges in Dublin. Uh, but he's also had spells at the Central Bank of Ireland, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and as advisor to the Taoiseach, uh, Garrett Fitzgerald. Uh, since September 2009, he's been Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, uh, in which capacity he's also a member of the ECB's Governing Council. He was therefore at the helm of the Central Bank during the worst of the Eurozone debt crisis and was intimately involved in, in handling the Irish response in particular. Uh, and I should say he's actually just about, I think, the last week of your term, so this is his valedictory uh, address as uh, central bank governor. Uh, for those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is uh, hash LSE econ. Uh, I'd ask you please to put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event. Uh, this, this evening's event is being recorded uh, and will hopefully be made available uh, as a podcast, uh, assuming there's no technical uh, hiccups. Uh, as usual, after the lecture, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions to the speaker. Uh, but now, will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Honohan to LSE to deliver his lecture entitled Debt and Austerity, Post-Crisis Lessons from Ireland. Thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you for inviting me back to the LSE. It's not the first time, but it is now over 40 years since I embarked on my PhD studies under Michio Morishima and Cliff Weimer, having first taken the MSc in Econometrics and Mathematical Economics, which was a tough course, anchored then by Terence Gorman, another Irishman, and Dennis Sargon. And I re was recalling that they were ably supported by up-and-coming stars such as Partha Dasgupta, David Hendry, Steve Nickel, Amartya Sen, cutting their teeth on, on uh, I suppose they were cutting their teeth on us as students. <laughs> my, my topic then was uncertainty, portfolio choice, and economic fluctuations. Actually, what does Michio Morishima suggest the title when he heard that what I was going to do? I thought it was a great title, and it has not proved irrelevant to someone involved in macroeconomic and financial sector policy over the years. Um, and I still draw on the framework taught at the LSE in the 1970s with its emphasis on solid data analysis, time series econometrics, as well as attention to distributional issues, both in terms of business cycle dynamics, those distributional issues around that, and cross-sectional welfare economics. And all of this and more has been needed to understand and respond to the required economic adjustments that emerge following a financial crisis, whether in Europe or elsewhere. Well, from late 2008, the inevitability of a devastating economic downturn in Ireland, entailing massive job losses, acute indebtedness difficulties, became increasingly clear. And the task for the Irish authorities from then on was to limit the aggregate damage and navigate through the coming years in such a way as to maximize the chances of a strong recovery of employment and incomes. And in parallel, this would entail choices that would influence how the looming burden would be distributed. And recovery is underway. Let me just uh, remind you that having leapt from 4 to 15 percent, unemployment is back in single digits. In fact, today's uh, numbers bring it down below 9 percent. The decline is partly attributable to migration, but job growth has already 
returned. The Irish downturn hit bottom in the middle of 2012, and the recovery since then has been, I would say, solid. Employment grew by a cumulative 7.5% uh, in the three, I'm, I'm adding, adding today's numbers, so about 2.5% about two and, two and per annum since the, since the bottom. Um, a couple of slides here just to, just to show you what it looks like. Um, I suppose if I press this, something will happen. No. Maybe if I press that, something will happen. Yes. So there's the unemployment rate. I promised you it would come down below 10%. It has come down, and it's, uh, it's a, a bit lower now because I didn't update the numbers today. You can see this very dramatic increase in, in, the, uh, in unemployment in the uh, early part of the crisis. 2008, uh, the, years the years of, uh, before the uh, crisis began, unemployment was running around 4 to 5%, and then it jumped up. Just a quick comparison with the previous crisis, which was really less than a generation ago in the mid-1980s. I thought we would never see another uh, huge crisis in my lifetime. Um, and actually, it's quite interesting to see that the blue line is the earlier crisis, the crisis of the 1980s. Uh, unemployment peaked in this crisis, the red crisis, at a lower rate than in the 1980s and has come down uh, very sharply. It, it, it rose more or less at the same speed and has come down uh, even more sharply than in the 1980s. So that's uh, interesting and to me a little bit surprising. I thought we were going to be stuck for longer, uh, but I don't want to take, uh, go too far afield into that. Let me show you the employment data and you can see the rapid rise in employment during the boom years, particularly from 2004 up to 2007, and then a, a very sharp decline. And that blue vertical line is more or less where the uh, EU IMF program began. And at the end, you see an upward trend since the middle of 2012, and we could continue on that trend more or less at the same rate in the last quarter. Well, look, the ar origins of the Irish financial and economic crisis uh, are well understood. The housing boom and bust and the damage done by that boom and bust to the stability of the public finances. I'm, I'm going to skip over this uh, fairly lightly. I have a somewhat longer text, which uh, is up uh, presumably by now on, on the website, if you want to dig into my analysis of the, the origins. I'll just mention a few points. Um, the role of bank credit you do get qualitatively similar features to the Irish boom in evidence in other countries uh, in, in those years. What made Ireland distinctive was the scale of credit expansion and the fact that a, a credit-fueled property bu price bubble was accompanied by a construction boom, and not even noticeably moderated by the construction boom. And the, the textbook would say, well, the construction boom, that will uh, provide supply and the prices will start coming down, but that didn't happen during that, that phase, exacerbating the scale of losses. After a record-breaking run-up to the point where Dublin residential property prices deflated by CPI were about three and a half times the level of a decade before, real incomes increased by about 40%, so that's a big increase in the housing price to income. Property prices in Ireland peaked around the turn of 2006-07, so well below, before uh, Lehman's, and started falling quite sharply soon thereafter. I have a, I have a picture of the, the sharp rise. And there's real house prices. It goes back to 1970, uh, arbitrary index there. We thought that little boom, you see 1980 there is a peak of a boom. Uh, I thought I'd made a big mistake. I bought my house in 1980, but... <laughs> Looks like I didn't do it too badly. It seemed like an awful thing to have done at the time. You can see the prices uh, fell subsequently. Anyway, you can see very sharp uh, bubble there, and you can see very sharp recovery in, uh, in latter uh, recent quarters. By the autumn, I think we have one more house price slide, just for aficionados. Dublin was really the center of it, but uh, the rest of the country had large quantities of houses, which are now beginning to fill up, but um, the, the Dublin boom and bust was the driver. By the autumn of 2008, as I said, it was clear that a major economic uh, correction was underway. Employment and construction was falling, knock-on effects throughout the economy. 
the fiscal position was suddenly deteriorating. While there had on average been a general government surplus for the previous decade, uh, and gross government debt shrinking to below 25% of GDP by 2007, reliance on the boom time sources of revenue were now evaporating. And, and that reliance had been so large that a sizable deficit was now emerging, augmented by the increasing cost of social protection spending as unemployment rose. The deficit was growing both in absolute terms and especially as a percentage of GDP, which was already shrinking alarmingly. So we're talking 2008 Nine. Total government spending jumped from 39% of GDP in 2007 to 58% two years later. Uh, so that wasn't because the government decided to splash out, that's your automatic stabilizers. So that was the benefit of the tax and spending movements. They had the benefit of bringing a strong automatic stabilizer. Uh, and the general government position, though, moved from a balance to a deficit of about 14% of GDP in those two years. Uh, it would have been 11.5% in the absence of any bank rescue spending in, in 2009. So nothing to 11.5% in just normal government finances. So this would not be sustainable for long. Recognizing the rapid deterioration in the public finances, even before the banking costs, the government already began a program of fiscal adjustment in 2008. Uh, now, you might consider that pro-cyclical because the economy is, is, is shrinking and the government is tightening. But a deficit of 14 or even 11% of GDP can hardly be considered austere. So you have this sort of paradox. Uh, you, you're, you have a huge deficit and yet you're operating in a pro-cyclical manner. And you're doing so because you don't think this is going to be sustainable for long. Taxation of income in particular was increased and that's relevant for what I'm going to say about distribution afterwards, and a four-year plan of tax and expenditure changes designed to restore stability to the public finances was underway. And then additional fiscal pressure was emerging from the banking system. Now, faced just after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers with the imminent collapse of the third largest bank, Anglo, wholly unaware of the scale of embedded losses in bank balance sheets, the government stepped in with a blanket guarantee for the liabilities of the locally controlled banks. Uh, at first, it was not expected by the national financial authorities that the guarantee, which was copper fastened in legislation, it couldn't just say, oh, well, we didn't really mean that. When we said guarantee, well, it didn't, it was copper fastened in legislation. It wasn't expected by them that it would entail a significant budgetary outlay, but they hadn't built in any safety first mechanism in that uh, uh, rescue effort to limit the state's exposure to the pig and the poke that they had acquired. And it soon transpired that supervisory awareness of the vulnerability of the banks to the property turndown had been very limited. So then we come to the sudden stop. The combination is combination of loss of tax revenue, increased spending on social transfers, and the crystallization of a huge contingent liability on foot of the bank guarantee, that's what created the vulnerability of the Irish sovereign to a sudden stop in its access to international funding. Austerity and the macroeconomic adjustment. The fiscal plan embedded in the EU IMF program, which was negotiated in November 2010, fully recognized the deterioration in the economic and fiscal conditions that had occurred since the government's own four-year adjustment program had been launched back in early 2009. And the deterioration of conditions at home and abroad meant that further belt tightening would be needed, though in fact most of the heavy lifting was already done in 2008 to 10. The new plan negotiated with the Troika envisaged reaching a 3% deficit by 2015. Now, this could have seemed a stretch to a naive observer, noting that the recorded deficit for 2010 was 31% of GDP. The statisticians insisted that all of the bank uh, the losses, uh, the recapitalization of the banks, should be recorded as part of the deficit uh, in the year in which the, uh, the outlays were made. So you had a deficit of 31% of GDP, which is a really a real European record. About two-thirds of that 
related to bank recapitalization. But in fact, the 3% deficit by 2015 was more than achieved. Well, I suppose I shouldn't say that because it's only November, but they don't look like coming anywhere near that. So how, how uh, was this adjustment achieved compared to some other countries' performance? And so unlike the situation in Greece, and to a lesser extent other stressed countries making fiscal adjustments at that time, the Irish program employed a realistic set of macroeconomic spending multipliers from the outset, from November 2010. So we, the Irish authorities and the, the Troika officials, knew how much the economy was going to be adversely affected by the spending cuts. And they knew that scale of, of, of multiplier, and they were right. So while the forecasts for GDP did prove to be somewhat optimistic for the early years of the program, this was wholly due not to the, any uh, mistake in calculating multipliers in the domestic economy, but was wholly due to the underperformance of Ireland's trading partners, not least uh, due to the double-dip euro area recession of 2012. In other words, if the trading partners had performed as well as was forecast in, in, uh, at the time the program was negotiated, then Ireland would have been right on target. Okay, so that's the historical story, and I want to arrange the remainder of my remarks around five FAQs. Uh, so question one is, should the fiscal plan built into the Irish program have involved larger deficits? In other words, should, have, should less austerity have been planned? Now, whatever about other EU countries, and I'll come to that in a minute, with Ireland's gross government debt soaring to 120% of GDP by 2012, and with much punditry in the air at first about the apparent attractions of a sovereign default or debt restructuring, Ireland's unilateral ability to run a more relaxed fiscal stance was extremely limited. Indeed, it was not altogether clear at the time the program that Ireland's emerging debt situation was sustainable. Let me look at, let's look at, the, um, at those, some of those curves. There's the, there's the deficit. Well, it's actually, it's the surplus. So you can see it's surplus in, in uh, nearly every year for the decade before the crisis. And then you can see that 2010 number, that uh, 31%. And even without the bank costs, the red number is without the bank costs, you see very, very sizable uh, deficits. And it's not looking good, and uh, observers would say, I'm not sure Ireland can get out of this. And uh, the next slide is also informative. It gives you the debt profile. And it seems like Ireland's debt has just, if you're sitting in 2010, it hasn't peaked yet, but my goodness, is it soaring. And it's not only those sort of headline numbers. I just give you those just for, for flavor. But neither the... Uh, Officials, certainly the IMF officials, they put it on record that they couldn't say with great assurance that the, that the Irish uh, uh, debt profile was sustainable, uh, but also the Irish officials uh, were doubtful that it was sustainable. Of course, in addition to debt ratios, and by the way, percentage of GDP could flatter Ireland because GDP has a lot of uh, multinational profits uh, in it, so GNP might be a better denominator. Uh, but uh, apart from debt ratios, servicing costs are also relevant in assessing debt sustainability. And what happened to turn the Irish uh, situation from possibly not sustainable to, yes, sustainable and we got out of it, was really changes in the servicing costs of the debt. And they improved dramatically from mid-2009 and 11, so six or, or seven months after the program was negotiated, when the surcharges over cost of funds were greatly reduced in respect of the borrowings from the European official creditors. The original loans were made at around 5.8%. Uh, these involved very significant cost uh, excess over, over cost of funds to the European official borrowers, and those surcharges were dramatically reduced in 2011. Furthermore, repayment of most of the higher cost IMF borrowings in 2013 and 2014 and their substitution by market borrowings, now again available at spreads of, well, I think it's 55 basis points above Germany in 10 years today, they also greatly eased debt servicing costs, as did the general lowering of long-term interest rates in the euro area 
and the arrangements around the collateral seized by the central bank uh, when the successor to Anglo-Irish Bank, IBRC, was liquidated in early 2013. All of these contributed to lowering the servicing costs of the debt. They didn't change the debt ratio, but it's, they suddenly made it more affordable. In the view of many, including myself, these servicing cost improvements made the difference between a sustainable program and one which likely would have had to be prolonged or renegotiated. Could fiscal adjustment have been slowed sufficiently to reduce the employment loss that occurred without this simply postponing an inevitable adjustment and potentially making the long-run effect of the needed adjustment even worse? To slow the fiscal adjustment would clearly have entailed a higher rate of primary deficit, thereby contributing to the accumulation of debt. But would there have been offsetting effects, for example, through the avoidance of hysteresis and unemployment, reducing future unemployment-related fiscal spending? What would the medium-term effect on the cost of borrowing have been? And what might the impact have been on capital formation and saving? These are not easy questions to answer. Macroeconomic models that work well through the crisis periods are hard to find, so you can't use models that you can trust and, uh, and, and turn up or down debt ratios. Calibration must be rather speculative. But in the range where Ireland found itself, it's simply not the case that fiscal contractions are self-defeating. Corrective action does work, the deficit ratio was reduced substantially, and in due course the debt ratio was placed on a downward trajectory. But even, even if you could, even if you uh, could have done something different, could a path closer to full employment have been maintained at the cost of a more gradual adjustment of the deficit and accumulation of more debt? This too must be doubted. After all, the bulk of the fall in employment, there were 327,000 was the decline, over 15% was the decline in employment from peak to trough. I think I have the, that, um, em those employment figures again. No. Maybe it's the next one. Yes. So you can see this big fall. And now you see the point of putting the line there at the time when the, uh, the uh, uh, bailout was negotiated. You can see the bulk of the fall had happened in the 11 quarters before the program came into effect. Only a decline of 25,000 occurred between the fourth quarter of 2010 and the trough, which is actually seven quarters later. Now, the sharp fall in employment, half of them construction jobs, by the way, in the first three years of the downturn, would have been very hard to eliminate with aggregate fiscal demand. I think we can rule out any Keynesian mechanism strong enough to re-employ workers quickly who had lost their jobs as a result of this combination of a sectoral shock, construction, with an externally driven macroeconomic demand contraction. Anyone wishing to assert that a significantly better aggregate fiscal adjustment path in terms of the attained output and employment path than the one actually negotiated by one Irish government and implemented by its successor in the EU IMF program of 2010 thus has their work cut out for them. Indeed, I would argue that the speed of the subsequent recovery from about the middle of 2012 was enhanced by the way in which fiscal policy halted and then reversed the growth in the debt ratio. Delaying this dynamic would probably have slowed the economic recovery because it would have deferred the return of business confidence in Ireland's debt sustainability. Question two of my FAQs. How important was that bank guarantee in creating the need for fiscal contraction? Probably the most discussed aspect of the Irish debt crisis is this question, the role of the bank guarantee. I have repeatedly observed that the guarantee was too wide and too unconditional, and I won't repeat here the details of what might have been done differently. But while it is often correctly emphasized that the Irish government's guarantee socialized private losses, private bank losses, any overall assessment needs to consider a comprehensive alternative path and not simply fixate on the direct fiscal long-term costs of making good on the guarantee, costs that have been variously estimated in recent times as between 35 and 43 billion, or between 22 and 27 percent of 2008's GNP. One approach is to consider a counterfactual, in which Ireland would not have provided as extensive and unilateral bank guarantee in September 2008, either hoping to persuade European partner countries to share in the cost, risk of such a guarantee, 
are failing that, perhaps resolving the two weakest banks with heavy losses to senior bank creditors. That's what would be implied now by the BRRD legislation, which is uh, Europe-wide legislation coming into effect in the next uh, number of weeks. Of course, the decision makers of the time didn't consider such an option. Why? Because they didn't think there was a significant risk of losses on the scale that actually occurred. If they had pursued this course, it's clear that economic disruption, immediate economic disruption, could have been greater. And that has to be set against the cash savings. The net costs would have been lower, I think, but on, arguably by, only by a sum in single digits of billions. So if you want to start to scoring how much different decisions cost. But more importantly, the larger policy errors were made long before the bank guarantee. And perhaps the most interesting counterfactual to be considered is not something about the night of the guarantee, but is to imagine that the bank lending excesses of 2004 to 2007 could have been eliminated by much more aggressive and effective bank regulation then. If so, the post-crisis period of fiscal contraction could have been wholly avoided. So you'd have had a different macroeconomic path during the boom and in the bust. Well, this is work in progress, and I, I just put up one slide by a colleague, which shows you the sort of calculation you'd have to make. So you could have a, this is supposed to be consumption per head in Ireland, and the red line is supposed to say, without the property bubble, what would have happened? And of course, the boom would have been less, but the bust would also have been less, and the uh, by, by 2012, 2013, you're seeing much higher consumption per head, although not unaffected by the euro area crisis. So something like this, some pattern like this could be considered. There are losses, there, you, you don't have as favorable an outturn before the crisis, but you have a much fav more favorable one afterwards and continuing on. Of course, you can do this in many different ways, and, and I'm not uh, proposing this as an exact uh, quantification. Well, how has aggregate inequality moved in boom and bust? That's my question three. Uh, you can talk about inequality of income. You can talk about inequality of wealth. You can also talk about inequalities that are not just uh, vertical, but are horizontal, different classes of people, different groups. It's one thing to say that aggregate economic activity was protected by the Irish government as well as it could have been. But it's another to say that the income and capital losses were distributed in an equitable manner. By its very nature, the crisis hit some people, for example, those hit by unemployment in the downturn, or those who bought property at the top of the market, for example, more than others. But how did aggregate inequality change? And at first sight, at first sight, the situation here might not seem too inegalitarian. For example, Take the Gini coefficient. Do they still teach the Gini coefficient at the LSE? I, I think, think so. <laughs> so the blue line shows you the Gini on market income. In other words, before redistribution, before tax and, and, and social spending. And what's interesting here, this is for Ireland, in the crisis, the inequality goes up. There's more unemployment, so more people pushed into, into um, uh, having uh, no or very little market income. But look at the red line. And you can see that uh, the genie for disposable income, after taking account of income-related taxes and social spendings, hardly moved and indeed reached a lower level by 2012 than it had eight years earlier. So I think that's quite interesting. It's, it's not saying an awful lot about what the government did. It's saying perhaps more about the pre-existing structures of, of Ireland's tax and social welfare structure. There were things the governments did, but... And likewise for relative poverty lines, now let me see. Oh, those are just the numbers. You can see that there's almost no change between 2007 and 2012 in the post-redistribution Gini, although there's a big increase in the pre. Here are poverty rates. So this is on the 50% line. So it's a relative poverty. Um, what, what proportion of the population are below 50%? And uh, it, before the redistribution, you have the blue line, and you can see it's going up. It's going up actually before the bust, and it's, con it's continuing at a high level. But there again, on disposable income, poverty rates actually fell. The contrasting movements of the Gini on gross and net income reflect the degree to which reductions in social payments, were, there were some, but they were limited in the fiscal cutback, 
and they also reflect the progressive tone of income-related tax changes in the downturn. The Irish tax and welfare system held relative po poverty rates to levels comparable to those in the UK. Aha, uh -huh. for example, despite a much steeper increase in unemployment in Ireland. So you can see there that the UK doesn't have to work so hard, or doesn't work so hard, gets the uh, poverty rates down to roughly the same as in Ireland. I don't know why I don't have the data beyond 2011 for the UK, but anyway. Uh, the Irish uh, social tax and social welfare system has to work a lot harder, and it had to face uh, a deteriorating poverty rate in, in uh, pre-tax, pre if you like, pre-tax, pre-social uh, income. However, and this is important, we must not ignore the obvious fact that a proportional lowering of income surely means a more severe welfare income on lower income groups. Lower income groups really suffered more in this crisis, let's face it. I'm just talking about genie on income. That doesn't mean that uh, they were insulated from uh, bigger welfare losses. And so it should not be interpreted as saying that the burden has been shared equitably. Wealth. Well, I want to show you wealth because we don't see much about wealth until uh, uh, Piketty's book came out. Piketty is also an LSE um, person now. Uh, but we do actually have some, some numbers for wealth distribution in Ireland, thanks to a recent survey funded by the, by the Central Bank. Um, income calculations, of course, do not take account of the capital losses occurred, incurred, especially by those who would leverage themselves near the top of the market to buy residential property and other assets that su subsequently slumped in price. And so this aspect of the downturn is not evidently correlated with that of income changes. You might have lost your job, but you might not have got into property beforehand, or you might. There are sociological and demographic correlates of capital losses. Residential property losses in particular are disproportionately found in certain age groups, notably those in their late 30s and early 40s, because that's when they were getting into buying houses. And here's an interesting chart, which I don't think has been done by uh, some colleagues at the central bank. And what it shows you is, in 2006, uh, th that's the median net wealth of each age uh, group. And of course, the, uh, when you get to 35 to 54, 55 to 64, the highest age group, but when you're an old timer like me, it's slightly lower. But the blue lines uh, have, a, have a natural progression. The red lines have the same progression, but you can see that net wealth has been almost wiped out for that 35 to 44 age group. There has been a lowering for everybody, but, the, uh, but this is an, an illustration. There are many other ways of illustrating this, that the 35 to 44 age group has been disproportionately hit by capital losses. And of course, not everyone lost in the bust. After all, sellers of real estate in the boom period had again to fall back on when the downturn came. And households too uncreditworthy to have access to the borrowing. Those lucky people escaped this dimension of the boom and bust. Uh, so how about the net impact on wealth inequality? We can take a look at a genie of wealth as well. The absolute movements of wealth were large, but they affected all classes of individual and household. And hence the estimated movements of genie of wealth. Oh, I thought I had a chart on it. I have a chart. I'll just say what, what, uh, what, what it says. The estimated movements of uh, genie of wealth during the crisis are small, especially relative to the trend in the genie of wealth in Ireland over the previous quarter century. Actually, if you look at that, last time we had a wealth survey in Ireland was uh, 25 or more years ago. Genie was 0.52 in 1987, and now it's 0.65. But the change happened long before this boom and bust. We can say that in, in the, between 2006 and 2013, it moved between 63 and 65, having gone up sometime between 87 and 2006 from 52 to 63. Two more questions. Has personal over how has personal over-indebtedness been, been handled? Um, well, actually, I, I think I'll, I'm looking at the, the time. I think I'll, I'll skip that because I think this is not, not all that interesting. And I move on to the next question, which is more interesting. Uh, it, it has been handled in a, in, in a way that, uh, that attempts to use financial engineering. It has been handled, uh, on the whole, it'll be quite interesting uh, historical assessment. It has not been handled quickly enough. It has not been resolved. Uh, there are debt overhangs. The banks are not clear of their non-performing loans. Uh, we have tried a lot of things, but they haven't moved fast enough. But in the end, it may turn out that despite the uh, inefficiencies caused by that long period of delay, that the balance has not been too badly wrong. 
I do consider it a sort of failure not to have achieved a quicker resolution of it, but the end resolution may not be too bad, just happening too many years too late. The role of international solidarity, could it have done more? So the, this question is about whether other options were potentially available at the level of the European Union to reduce the damaging output and activity effects of the fiscal contraction, thereby potentially accelerating the recovery in Ireland, and if so, why were they not implemented? So I have a few, a few uh, possible ideas here. And like the dealing with personal indebtedness, one possibility is financial engineering. And I'll give you two examples of things that weren't done and could have been done. The first example is about bank recapitalization. As negotiated, the EU IMF program included a sum of 35 billion, which is about one-fifth of annual GNP, to be provided by the government for additional recapitalization of the banks on top of what they had already done in 2010, uh, if needed to meet the higher capital requirements of the program and to cover deleveraging costs and more aggressive stress test assumptions that could result from a new capital adequacy review, which was to be carried out in the early months of the program. Now, in the end, less than half of this 35 million billion was needed, and much of what was injected in this phase will eventually be recovered by the government as it sells off its stake in the three surviving banks. One of the reasons it wasn't needed was that uh, subordinated debt holders uh, burden, were, were, bore part of the burden at that point. But would it not have been better for these sums to have been injected directly by the European uh, Stability Mechanism, the ESM? thereby pooling tail risk more effectively by shifting it for a price to the larger entity. So Europe obviously could take the risk that bank losses were going to be bigger than anybody thought. They could take it more easily than the Irish government. In fact, if the bank losses had been as big as this 35 billion, possibly the Irish government couldn't have, have, have absorbed that. So was the financial engineering not just simply wrong here? They could have, for example, ESM could have taken an equity stake in the relevant banks directly, not just give, lend the money to the government to take the equity stake, or it could have offered a tail risk insurance on the bank's assets, rather than adding to the debt overhanging the government. This point was argued by the Irish authorities at the time, but received a stony response. A smaller debt overhang for the Irish government in 2011 would surely have hastened the restoration of market confidence, the recovery of productive investment and consumption spending, sustaining domestic economic activity, and the recovery of the public finances. And the ESM might well have made a higher return on the capital injection than it has on the government loan. So this, I do think, was a missed opportunity. Second possibility for financial engineering, a GDP growth-linked loan. The Irish government did have to borrow on a scale which threatened debt sustainability, as I've said. Could the debt have been structured in a way that reduced that threat? Clearly, yes. A GDP growth-linked loan could have substituted for part of the debt. Such a contract would have transformed the consequences of a slower-than-hoped-for recovery by limiting or eliminating debt servicing payments in an orderly and pre-agreed way until GDP recovered sufficiently. This, too, would have accelerated the return of private sector confidence and boosted economic activity. Servicing of the indebtedness would not, in fact, have been interrupted because the return of confidence would have ensured that the growth happened on schedule. And here again, the ESM could, depending on the parameterization of the contract, have cleared a larger profit in a win-win result. This, too, was floated to an unresponsive ESM and IMF, neither of which had such tools available. And I'm thinking here not just of what might have been, but what could be in the future in other cases. What about stronger EU demand policy? Uh, another possible uh, measure from countries with headroom. Even if stressed countries like Ireland had no headroom for relaxing fiscal adjustment, this was not the case for the euro area as a whole. While aggregate euro area debt ratios increased a lot during the crisis, they were still well away from a danger point, not least when the low level of long-term government bond yields on this unstressed countries are taken into account. Aggregate fiscal policy in the euro area was strongly contractionary, and this adversely affected stressed countries. The scale of the favorable demand spillover might not have been uniform or large, but it would have been advantageous. I have a few other things I'm, again, looking at time. I have, a, I have a question. Could the ECB have stopped the bank run that precipitated the bailout? Probably yes, but 
actually glad that we had the protection of the programme instead of the Irish government trying to stumble through uh, what would have been uh, further months or years of uh, limited access to international markets. Um, and then I need to mention the very widely discussed issue of the holders of senior bank debt. It's well known that the Irish government was leaned upon in late 2010 and mid-2011 to avoid burden sharing with the holders of unguaranteed senior debt in the failed banks, Anglo and INBS. The sum involved here was about 5 billion, was left over 3% of Ireland's GNP. From Ireland's point of view, saving, saving even a fraction of this amount, though not quantitatively a game changer, would have been a valuable contribution to the fiscal adjustment and would have helped cement public acceptance of the legitimacy of the program. And the Irish authorities were, by late 2010, prepared to take the risk of a potential adverse effect on funding costs, especially now that the sovereign's financing was under the protection of the program. I think it's fair to say that European decision makers subsequently had misgivings about having blocked this bail-in of senior bondholders, not least when they eventually came round to the view, now embodied in the uh, European Bank Resolution legislation, that governments should be largely insulated from the costs of failing banks. And this may well have influenced their willingness to acquiesce in the subsequent arrangements around the liquidation of the relevant institutions in 2013 arrangements which had considerable financial advantages to Ireland. <coughs> Let me conclude by saying a few words about the role of trust. and It happens in so many different aspects of this. Just as the initial loan is made only if the borrower seems creditworthy, trust is also involved in the solution to debt restructuring. The willingness of lenders to restructure household indebtedness that I skipped over depends on their confidence that the potential for such restructuring will not induce borrowers to move into default. Lender suspicion and fears of such moral hazard has undermined progress in household debt resolution. But trust also arises in sovereign debt. Official international lending in Europe is not operated by a maximizer of a social welfare function, such as you read in, in your textbooks, and of the type which I studied here four decades ago, but uh, operates in a political environment where lack of trust among senior politicians against the background of well-founded concerns about moral hazard is a decisive element. Distracted by the Greek th crisis in 2010, financial markets woke up late to the scale of Ireland's twin fiscal and banking imbalances, which the Irish authorities had already been tackling through fiscal contraction, bank loss recognition, and recapitalization. This delayed recognition temporarily undermined market confidence and trust against, and against a background of defaultist rhetoric also induced official lenders to seek to protect their interest as creditors. And the result was a program whose initial lending terms and conditions were neither realistic nor reflective of the collegiality appropriate to the European Union. But trust was quickly restored thanks to the credible performance of successive Irish governments in the early months of the program, and the lending terms were, were um, soon adjusted. Trust and the fear of moral hazard has remained a preoccupation of official lenders in relation to other countries and has inhibited the employment of more innovative contracts that could help restore fiscal balance with less damage to economic performance in the process. Financial engineering helped create the global financial crisis, even if it contributed little to the Irish bubble. It's time to use more of it to get us out of the unduly protracted tail to that crisis. And finally, trust of the general public in the intentions and judgment of policymakers is also vital in ensuring that society as a whole accepts the constraints and hardships of needed fiscal adjustment. A patently unfair distribution of the burden will not long be tolerated in any democratic society. And while there is plenty of room for disagreement on whether enough was done to shelter the most vulnerable, the Irish social safety net at least prevented any sizable deterioration in overall measures of inequality during the adjustment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Uh, we now come to um, uh, time for questions. I'm going to uh, abuse Chairman's privilege by asking the first one, but I already see uh, hands going up in the audience. Um, the, uh, it, it is striking that um, Ireland went through uh, a fairly large adjustment process with relatively limited uh, domestic political unrest and resistance. And I think it's a, a striking contrast, say, with Greece. Now, the economics 
of Greece is very different from Ireland. Ireland, it was a banking problem that brought down the sovereign, um, whereas Greece, it was a sovereign problem that then uh, reflected back on the, uh, the banks. Um, but are there any particular lessons that you would want to draw from the way Ireland handled its correction uh, for the ongoing Greek problem? Um, well, I don't have a, a, a silver bullet, but I, I like to go, if you can say this person said this, that person did that. I like to go behind why the Irish public uh, have uh, coped with this situation in a way that has worked for them. And I think it's because of the a great internationalization of Irish society. Everybody has friends and relatives who live in Britain, in the United States, in Australia, in, 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 in the mainland uh, Europe. They understand how the international economic system works, at least you know, at, at some level. And they understand uh, the consequences of uh, not adjusting and not reacting to a, an emerging uh, disastrous debt situation. So I think it's at that level, there's a very sophisticated understanding of we, better, we may not like this, we may not think it's fair, but we want to get out of it alive, and we know that this is more or less the way to do it. And I think that, that uh, Ireland is, is f fairly unique in the degree to which it's internationalized, thanks also to the English language, so you mm -hmm. follow everything. And I, I think that has enabled uh, politicians to tell the story uh, in, in a way that's convincing to enough people. Now, I'm not saying it's a perfect, it was a perfect uh, exit from this thing. I'm sure things could have been done a lot better, uh, especially in areas for which I have, you know, I better not talk about because they're nothing to do with me. Um, but enough was done right in the broad sense that people said, yeah, this is the only way to do it. Okay, um, starting with the lady with the yellow scarf at the back. Uh, can you uh, wait for the mic? When you get the mic, please say who you are before you uh, give this question. My name is Sigrun Davidsdottir. I'm an Icelandic journalist, so obviously I know a little bit about crisis. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you, you mentioned that the state of the Irish banks uh, at the time of the guarantee had been um, a lot poorer than was known at the time, if I understood you uh, correctly. This obviously leads uh, the thoughts to the auditing of the banks um, and to alleged criminality. Um, ben Bernanke has recently mentioned that he actually thinks that criminality uh, should have been better investigated uh, far earlier. I know you have a little bit has been done in Ireland, but I wanted to ask you, do you agree with Bernanke that too little has been done in terms of looking at um, criminality? And secondly, you published a report in 2010 on the banking collapse, which I studied quite closely at the time because it was interesting in the Icelandic perspective. So I wanted to ask you, have you changed your mind in any way? Um, there was a lot of sort of perhaps and possibly, you know, you were very cautious in your report, so I want to uh, know if you had changed your mind since that report. Um, well, let's be clear, Bernanke says nothing, almost nothing about Ireland, so he's not talking about Ireland when he's, he's saying that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the several uh, criminal investigations and cases, some of which have been brought to conclusion in Ireland. Uh, it is not the case that criminality has not been investigated and acted upon and where there, uh, where there are also abuses of an administrative uh, kind identified, uh, which are not criminal, they have also been. It takes a long time to build cases if they are to, um, to be successful in court and, and in, in uh, administrative inquiries. So it should not be thought that, that this was set aside in, in any way. Um, as far, I was about, about the auditing issue. This is relevant to that. I'm not taking a holistic view of that. But if there's one point is, what is the value of a collateral in a bubble? So you say, OK, this, this loan is it's, uh, 200 million, and it's collateralized by these properties. How much are these properties worth? I hope they're worth 250 uh, million. So, so you get a value, and the builder says, well, yeah, it's worth 250 million. OK, good. We're in good shape. What does that mean? In a bubble, you're in a sort of binary situation. When the valuer says it's worth 250 million, 
that valuer is saying that a, a, an equity investor will pay 250 million for this because the equity investor has a chance that the bubble will continue and it'll be worth 300 million next year. Or it might collapse and it's going to be worth 150. And that could add up with the percentages. It could add up being definitely worth 250 million. Absolutely right. But the bank has made a huge mistake because the bank will not get any of that going from 250 to 300, but it will take the hit on going down to the 150. And that's a, a, a flaw in, in the way of thinking about how you deal with collateralization and risk management when you're in, in a bubble situation where valuations have wide uh, potential for f future changes. Uh, so you could say somebody checking the boxes, saying everything is fine, but because they weren't thinking what might happen in the crash. Okay, there was uh, uh, the man there. Yes, that's you. Yep. Yeah, good evening. My name is Fadia Hassan, and I'm an assistant professor at Trinity College Dublin, actually, and a research associate here. Uh, so I think Ireland went very well, I, like compared to other European countries that were hit. And so my question is more about the lessons that we can draw from Ireland and, and shifting the debate at the European level. And my question for you is about uh, the possible a cut of the depot rate in further negative territory that was hinted by Mario Draghi at the, uh, at, at, at the, list, uh, at the latest meeting. And do you think that this is a desirable measure and what effects would this have on the economy? Or whether this would just be a tax on the banking sector leading to further misallocation one of capital? One of the um, wonderful things about having one week to go is that <laughs> I have, I have, uh, uh, I have cast my last ballot in, in, in monetary policy arena. The next monetary policy meeting will be in December, and I am uh, fortunate not to have to worry about these issues, and uh, in, in line with the entire, in, entire, you know, the, you talk about Bernanke's uh, book, and it's an interesting book, very nicely written, and I just uh, finished reading it, and uh, their approach to communication around monetary policy in the United States, where they have a, a, a monetary, FOMC, Monetary Policy Committee, um, everybody can, can speak their mind, saying, oh, I think this is... And, and from that, which may become a cacophony, and he does have some remarks where he says, I think people really should have... Uh, restrain themselves a bit and let's have more uniform co communication. There is that wide disparity of communication. In the ECB, there is a convention, a strong convention and an agreement, going back long before the time I was on it. I've been, in, I've been on the ECB Governing Council for a third of the history of the euro, but still, it goes back to before my time, uh, that it's a single voice monetary policy, uh, that the president, Mario Draghi, is the spokesperson for the, for the monetary policy, and so if other governors or d deciders uh, speak on it. it. It's only to explain and amplify maybe in national languages the policy. Not everybody adheres as closely to this as I do, but today I'm going to adhere to it. <laughs> um, I, I should say the question, did I change my view on the 20, in the 2010? No, no, I haven't changed my view. I mean, there are one or two small things, very small things. So 98% is the same. Uh, this question that I'm, I kept, keep on getting asked about the 2008 bank guarantee and uh, I had to I have to lay out more and more pages to explain, but not to change my view on that. Okay, the, there's one in the centre there. Then the uh, gentleman with the beard, followed by the man next to him, and then I've got one over here. Thanks. Uh, my name is Roger Barris. I'm a retired real estate investor. And I, one thing I can tell you is that uh, one of the things that's amazing to us who were in the real estate industry is that any of us looking at the Irish banks back in 2005, 2006, 2007 knew that this was a slow motion train wreck, just for your knowledge. But my question is this, in your, uh, in your FAQ uh, number one, you basically said that, uh, that the parameters of the Irish economy were such that, that uh, austerity was not self-defeating. And what I'd like you to do is to contrast that with the, uh, with say, for example, the situation in Greece, because very often it's argued by, you know, particularly by Krugman, other strong Keynesians, that in that case, austerity is self-defeating. So what is the difference? What are those differences between what Ireland experienced and what, or maybe there are no differences, the, uh, uh, the alleged situation you have in a place like Greece where it is re re claimed to be self-defeating? Um, yeah. It, it, it's, um, I'm not an expert on Greece. Obviously, the Greek, Greek situation has gone, gone very badly, uh, no question, and, and, uh, and all sides uh, no doubt contributed to that. The Irish economy 
uh, seems to work better in the textbook. Why? It, it is a very open economy. It's, it has the possibility of shifting production, export production. It, ha it has huge imports, so it can compress those rather quickly. Um, the labor market is, is more flexible. Uh, wage rates, so oh, they didn't come down as much as people think. The unit labor costs did come down, but that's partly because of the shift away from construction into, into high tech. Um, it, it just works more like a textbook economy. The Greek economy is very closed. It, it, it doesn't have as uh, the, the labor force is, you know, facts. It does, it's not as well educated, not as, uh, it, and, and so it doesn't have the potential for, for a quick turnaround. But there's more to it than that in the, in the Greek case. I, I think the Irish economy, um, a lot of the adjustment has been in demand contraction. Let's face it, there has been export expansion, but a lot of the adjustment has been in demand contraction. But when you've got a lot of demand, a lot of sucking and a lot of imports, and you can still survive without those imports, um, you, you do have the potential for, again, the internationalization is part of the key to it. Uh, a usual government official uh, state would, would, would list all of the uh, wonderful features of the Irish economy, which are all explained in the recovery, but I, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't help but observe that you will also have benefited from the Bank of England's uh, quantitative easing and other programs. Uh, actually, uh, of course, um, and, uh, but could you have done more? Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, yeah. But actually, it's true. Mervyn, uh, a, a few governors around the world uh, called me in the middle of the worst of the crisis, including Mervyn King. And he says, is there anything we can do to help? <laughs> and I said, well, I can think of a few things. I don't think you're going to do them. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, one slide that I, I haven't shown today, but I have shown on different uh, other occasions, uh, the dramatic fall in unemployment. Now, now I've shown that unemployment is increasing, so certainly. But the fall in unemployment, is, if, you, if you show it up against uh, European or Euro area unemployment, you say, oh, these seem to be from different worlds. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's going on? And then you plot it against the British unemployment. Employment. Of course, you have to scale, but you can, by squishing and squashing, you can get them to fit very closely. Mm -hmm. And it's always been the way that Irish mm -hmm. unemployment, because of the close migration flows, so that part of it is mm -hmm. the, the better uh, British performance than Euro area performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Go. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Governor, I'm uh, John Hillstead, uh, LSE 64. And I live in Dublin, only recently. And I'd just like to reinforce a point you touched on, which I think is very important in the Irish economy. You talk about employment and all the rest of it. To my mind, Ireland is totally unique in the world as far as a small country is concerned. You know, they can pack up and go virtually anywhere in the world with a language. And that is being totally underestimated. And Coming from uh, Norway, way back, I know the difficulties, and you talk comparisons about Greece and all the rest of it. You can't make comparison. Thousands of Greeks couldn't pack up suitcases and go to Australia. Irish could do that, or Canada, or anywhere where there's English speaking. It's a huge advantage, and all credit to them for that. So I think that's a point that's very often missed as far as the Irish uh, structure, mm. and, and not only that, they are used to it. You talked about the 1980s and all the rest of it, same thing happened. A lot of them came back in, in the late 90s and early 20, 2000, and then they left again. But they, there is a cushion in Irish economy as far as unemployment is concerned, which, to my mind, no other small country in the world has. Secondly, my question is, as regards the Irish government at the moment, and partly you too, do you think it's realistic to raise public expectations as far as the public is concerned in Ireland today in view of recent improvements when you take the background of global growth being virtually zero or negative in most places, a debt of 200 billion, and bank performance debt being the highest in Europe. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, it's it's true that that uh, it, it's not a, a desirable safety net, but you do have a, a lot of migration. When people come back, they come back with lots of new ideas as well, and they infuse uh, Irish society. On the broad future uh, thing, uh, you mentioned some negatives, but um, and the slow grow global growth is a worrying factor, that, no, no doubt about it. But the the debt, uh, the numbers are are much lower than a lot of people projected earlier on. Uh, they are coming down as a percent of GDP. You had 120 percent uh, two years ago, three years ago, 120 percent. Two years ago, 120%. Last year, 107%. And now I think it'll be 96% at, at the end of this year, uh, ratio to GDP. So this debt situation is getting under control, has to be carefully managed. As you got no possibility of blowing out, but it's, it, it's coming under control. The non-performing loans of the banks, um, that too is, uh, is in a process that is under control. So the books, the bank, the loans are still on the books. They're still not fully performing, uh, but the process is under control, and the banks have made adequate provisions uh, in their accounts for the losses that they will take on those non-performing loans. So I'd like it to have been all sorted by now, but I'm comfortable that the banks have the financial and administrative resources to see this through over a period of time, which is much longer than I would have hoped for. Um, so, so, you, so in fact, it's realistic to talk the way they talk. So you want me to assess the pre-election conversations of different government parties? <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> okay, the, ge the gentleman with the beard, who's been very patient. Okay, thank you. Hello, Dr. Horan. Thank you very much for uh, your discussion here tonight. Um, I work in the city of London as a commercial real estate project manager, but. Um, in the past years, I've been unemployed in Cork in Ireland, so it's very valuable to hear yourself tonight uh, discoursing on how things have gone and so forth. Uh, my question to you is uh, concerning the actions the Irish government took in the height of the crisis uh, in relation to the European Union and the Troika, and to what extent the guarantees were to the foreign financial authorities that we made um, compared to our legal obligations. So the impression within the Irish public was that the Irish government made uh, commitments to foreign financial institutions that were not actually obligated under Irish law, but that you chose to undergo as a political movement. And uh, obviously there was a great degree of dissatisfaction within the Irish public as to how the Irish government handled all that. So I would like you to give an account to the people here as to why the government and uh, the broader public sphere made the moves that they did in the height of the, the questions of the time. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, um, okay. Uh, I actually have covered quite a lot of this in my talk so far today. And you, oh, that's all right. I will cover it now. Uh, first of all, there are a number of, of, of uh, points of, of time. There's a point in September 2008 when the Irish government entered into a government guarantee. I have said now tonight, and in many other occasions, I had nothing to do with it, it was a bad idea to provide such an extensive guarantee. It was expedient to, to do something, as every other government in Europe was doing. It was a bad idea to provide a, such a, an extensive guarantee, and one which left open such a large tail risk. I have said that repeatedly. Everybody agrees with this proposition, so I do not see why this... It had nothing to do with the European institutions. They were not involved in it at all. I have no information or evidence that there was any uh, pressure or desire from the Euro European institutions for a guarantee of this type. Nor do you have any evidence, so let's put that to rest. In 2010, and then again in 2011, the Irish government was interested in the idea of not, of, of uh, dealing with the uh, banks which had been recapitalized in such a way that, uh, that senior bondholders would share in the burden. They might, the Irish government and the Irish authorities might have achieved something on that, but in fact, preemptively, some of the Troika raised it as part of the discussion. Some of the officials raised this as part of the, uh, the idea that, oh, why don't you do this? 
And we said, oh, okay, yeah, go. And then they were countermanded by other officials, said, no, 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 we don't want you to do that. And it was quite clear, no agreement was signed that this wouldn't be done, but it was quite clear that there would be problems if, uh, in, in finalizing a, a loan agreement if there was to be made. So it was shelved and put on the long, long finger. Subsequently, as, 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 as I've mentioned, there were considerable reductions in the uh, servicing cost of the, of the loans and in the, in the arrangements around the liquidation, ultimately, of that, that, that bank. So yes, there is a problem about the way in which this uh, matter was dealt with. Interestingly, interestingly, not everybody was in agreement with this in the, on the European side. The German uh, president of the German Bundesbank uh, argued openly in public uh, that for the bail-in of senior bondholders in, in, in May of, of 2011. Uh, others uh, did not feel this was a, a good idea. So it's not Europe versus Ireland. A lot of Irish people thought it was a bad idea as well. Uh, ben Bernanke's book uh, rose in behind uh, the same view that was held by the uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner, thought it was a bad idea. Uh, to, to bail in. That, that, so that's the American view, contrary to the German view. It's not exactly what you might think. You might think, oh, Americans would be in favor. No, it's not. It's the other way around. I think on the whole, uh, it would have been better to do that bail in. It would have been cleaner. It would have been given a, 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 a clear signal to, uh, to investors in, in bank bonds. The BRRD has already established that. In the end, I am very doubtful that we would have got as favorable a treatment on the uh, interest rate and the uh, arrangements around the, the promissory note and the bank if there had been a bail-in. said, you had your bail-in, so stop talking. So I think on net, uh, does Ireland comes out of this okay? I don't think the decisions were taken in the right order, but I think Ireland comes out of it more or less okay. 2008, obviously a mistake. Hasty decisions, lots of mistakes were made at that time. Okay, over there is next. Uh, just wanted to ask you about house prices. Um, you showed uh, the slide where the last uh, couple of quarters uh, the house prices in Ireland have been increasing. And in, in the context of lessons learned, just wondered your um, position on whether there should be a correction back to some level of the, the bubble. and. Uh, if so, how far? And uh, what about long-term house prices? Obviously, it's, it's, um, if you're a property holder, you love your price going up, but what do you think is a, a sensible long-term uh, house price increase to avoid another bubble? So from between, um, between the summer of, or the spring of 2000, and I'm going to mix up dates now, spring of 2013 and the autumn of 2014, an 18-month period, there was a 42% increase in Dublin house prices. And uh, uh, we thought this was a, a rather concerning uh, a pace, uh, particularly when you realize that there was a bubble psychology was taking hold again. People who had money, and there are still people who have money, were saying, better get into this Dublin property market so that we get in before the prices go back to where they were. were. Uh, although credit was not a major player in this because most half of the properties were being bought with by cash buyers. Um, we decided the central bank to introduce macroprudential uh, uh, rules, which are stricter, more strict than the ones. Were you still in the Bank of England when when the uh, PRA introduced or whatever? Oh yeah, yeah, FSF absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. our our ones are better than than your ones, <laughs> <laughs> and and. Um, and this was not an easy thing to do. I mean, a lot of political capital has been used up on that. And people don't like to be told that uh, their possibility from borrowing from, from a bank for housing is, is being uh, re restricted. But we decided to use up uh, all our political capital on this because we wanted to make a clear, send a clear signal that the tools are available to the financial authorities and will be used to prevent any recurrence of this bubble. So I don't know where Dublin house prices will be in five years' time, but I know there won't be another bubble because we have the tools and we're using them. Okay, the next one is about five along that same road. Then I've got a couple uh, at the back. Can I ask people to keep their questions 
uh, fairly short and crisp because there's a lot of hands still to get work. Um, I'd just like to clarify first that I believe that uh, the elite have definitely walked away from this financial, uh, what you call crisis, they've walked away as a great success from all this. And it's only the people that have uh, suffered the crisis of austerity. And you talked about job figures uh, increasing. Does that figure include zero hour contracts or something of a similar nature? If so, then uh, I believe they should not be included in uh, uh, any kind of growth figure because it distorts uh, an actual progress out of a, a, what you're calling a recession. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I don't disagree that the, uh, that the lower income group suffered more. I don't disagree with that at all. Um, and that's why I, I uh, went into quite a lot of those distributional issues. Uh, but I think that the system has limited the damage. That's, what I, that, that's the argument I wanted to make. Um, uh, and it, maybe it should have limited it more, but it has limited the damage, and this has to be acknowledged. So the, the inequality measures would have risen if, if there hadn't been those, those, uh, uh, those mechanisms in place. Uh, yeah, you, can, you can chop and, and parse and analyze the employment numbers. Uh, there is a solid increase in full-time work as well as in part-time work, and you're uh, limited. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't, ha I can't give you numbers here and, and, and there, and that's not my topic today. <laughs> the, the, this casualization problem uh, has, is something that has been going for some time, isn't part of the, of the crisis. I, all I'll say is, I, I'm, I'm, probably I should have prepared myself more fully on that question, but all I'll say is that full-time work has increased substantially as well. Okay, at the back. In the last couple of months, uh, we saw that sterling got so strong. So I was uh, wondering, what's your idea about uh, sterling against euro so strong? That, uh, I mean, I think it's uh, the consequence of a QE of Mario Draghi, but at the end of the day, this, what's your evaluation? Can be can have some consequence on Ireland or England? or And what's your forecast about what's going on? Because it's been... Um, like a strong in short term in, uh, um, a Swiss about a sterling against euro. So it makes me thinking about that. It's um, it's certainly quite quite a a conspicuous improvement in the competitiveness of of Irish industry dealing with Britain. Uh, it, Britain is still the major trading partner, the largest trading partner of Ireland, though much more diversified than, than uh, it, it was like 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and, and this has been part of the growth recovery. Actually, going back to 2008, sterling was ex extremely weak. And at that time, on top of all the other problems, and I blame you personally for this, Charlie, <laughs> um, the uh, if you track back and convert euros into old Irish pounds at the, at the conversion rate, 2008-9, these were record levels. Uh, the Irish pound was, uh, from memory, something like the equivalent of one pound 15 sterling, um, if you did that, that conversion, which we never saw anything like that, even in, in 1992, um, during the, the ERM crisis, it didn't get, get that high. And that was an additional burden. So from, from the competitiveness of, of, of Ireland, um, you have to say that uh, a, a strong sterling is um, quite good news. What, 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 what about, what about oh, my forecast? Here's a forecast for exchange rates. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that'll cost you a little more. <laughs> uh, uh, the gentleman in the grey pullover. Uh, good evening, Governor. Uh, Tristan Carlyle with Central Banking. Uh, on macro potential policy, what would you say is the priority area for research? Is it measuring the effect of the tools, the interactions with monetary policy, or something else? And secondly, what advice would you give to your successor on navigating governing council meetings? <laughs> um, so macroprudential, uh, what I'd say about macroprudential is they are very, very effective in the short run. It, 
even more effective than, than I expected, but, but fortunately we'd calibrated them right. Um, <coughs> in the medium term, not so clear, particularly in a, say, a, a more uh, articulated financial system like in the United States, maybe in, in Britain, uh, the potential for evasion must be considerable. Uh, but their impact effect is, is very good. So um, I think there's good practices. Partly, part of what we put in in our micro potential is, is uh, you know, you banks should have these good practices anyway. This should be your benchmark. This shouldn't, shouldn't be something we have to tell you. Um, but when they're tighter than that, I, I think they're only temporary instruments. People are always looking for the possibility of having, you have two problems. You've got general inflation and you've got asset prices. Uh, general inflation, deal with it with interest rates. Asset prices, deal with it with, with macro proof. I think I... I'm, that's very crude, but maybe it's more or less what I think. Um, so uh, the question, biggest research question, and we did quite a lot of work on it in the central bank, but I wouldn't claim we have the last word on it, um, is calibration. Where, where is the, where are the, 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 um, the, the, the ideal point to press the button? Is it 80 percent? Is it 85 percent? What percentage of that of the of the bank's book can be allowed above the threshold level? Um, and there's quite a lot of, of microeconomics that you can do if you have loan loss data that's broken down by the type of household, what their loan to value ratio was at initiation and so forth. Um, governing council, 25 people now. It's a big committee. Uh, meets every now six weeks instead of that was great innovation, which happened just a little while ago, and I was enthusiastic for it. It uh, gives you more time to prepare, to not have to be just fielding questions about what you're doing this month, next month. In fact, I think going to two months would, would be, I'd be okay with going to, to two months. Um, I'd say to, um, to uh, Philip Lane, I've already given him my secret formula. <laughs> it's very effective. <laughs> okay, uh, I have Tim Frost next uh, here. Uh, I'm aware there's a couple at the back. I haven't forgotten you. But Tim put his arm up a long time ago. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Tim Frost, uh, alum of the school and also a student of Professor uh, Morishima. Uh, Governor, you touched a couple of times quite flippantly on the relationship with the UK authorities. You, you talked about uh, sterling and uh, quantitative easing. With a former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England next to you there, would you like to characterise relations with the UK through the crisis? Was the UK just like a, a, another European country or were there times when it felt uh, different, perhaps better and perhaps worse? And, and as you think about that, I wonder if you'd want to uh, comment on whether or not the fact that, um, you, that um, Northern Ireland is uh, very obviously shares a land border with the Republic. Did that ever influence or, or, or have an impact on your thinking as you went through the crisis? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, well, since I started, all, all I can say about, about my time, I, we know we can read uh, his, uh, politicians' memoirs and, and we know there was a, a dissatisfaction and tension at the time of the bank guarantee because uh, British banking system was having its own pressures. And here was a government, a Euro area, a European government putting its weight behind the banking system and uh, possibly threatening uh, flows away from the British banking system. So I, I think that would have caused some tensions. But I'm, I don't have first hand experience of, of that. I mean, as uh, somebody who's, you know, London graduate and knowing people, I think their relations were always good with Pretty the good. Bank of England. We never, and, and, and also with the, uh, with the FSA, uh, we had close contacts and we could lift the phone to each other. And, and as you say, a lot of Irish financial institutions do business uh, in Britain, in, 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 in the, uh, Britain and, and, and in Northern Ireland. And, uh, and so we have to talk to each other to make each other aware of these things. And, and there have been institutions that have got into difficulty um, who had a lot of uh, a lot of business in in Britain, so I think they were. Um, now there's been a huge shrinkage of the Irish banks. They have retrenched a lot. There's still players in the British market, but to a lesser extent than they were. 
and there's been retrenchment from British-owned institutions from Ireland, which was not helpful to us, but um, Lloyd's pulled their, their subsidiary out, which was an important player. Uh, they pulled it out at the end of, of 2010. Uh, there were some regulatory uh, twists in the rules that if they didn't have an Irish subsidiary and they'd sold it off, then somehow this was going to be advantageous to them. Um, Ulster Bank, a subsidiary of Royal Bank of Scotland, has, has not pulled out. Um, and uh, they are actually quite a substantial player, full service bank, and they'll probably... Um, uh, so, the, but but there were, these things were discussed at a certain point. Royal Bank of Scotland was retrenching, uh, as we see. But we haven't had any frictions in my time, have we? No, no. no I don't think so. Still, call in Mervyn's promise to do something really helpful. Right. I'm. I'm. Apologise. We probably won't get everybody to answer questions. Uh, there's a couple in the middle here, and then I'll go back to the back row. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul Sam is my name. Um, in November 2010, the Irish government entered technical negotiations with the Troika on a possible programme. You're smiling already, Governor. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I think you've thought about this question in advance. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I think I'd remember. Um, um, you, uh, during these negotiations, you took the, to the airwaves and without the, the government's knowledge, and you directly contradicted the official government position. Um, this hastened the country's entry into a, a bailout program and perhaps undermined the government's position in those negotiations. So my question to you is, do you think it's appropriate for a member of the ECB Governing Council to undermine a sovereign government in this way, and do you regret the move? No, I don't regret the move, and I, I uh, disagree with many of the propositions advanced. First of all, um, I didn't agree, disagree with, with, with the government. I just t told the facts as they were, and I had good reason to do so because I had a statutory responsibility, I've been appointed by the President, uh, responsibility for financial stability, which could not be exercised without uh, adequate communication to the, to the public. Did not hasten our entry into the program, which was uh, done and dusted by that stage. All the, the, uh, the discussions were very far advanced. The boots were on the ground in Dublin already by the time I spoke. Um, so I'm very comfortable about all that, and, um, and I... Um, I think that, yes, politically it, it was uh, probably damaging for a few people who uh, found themselves in a position where their credibility had been diminished. Um, but that was their responsibility. My responsibility was to tell it as it was. Okay, and um, next you. Yeah. Yeah, much less controversial question about Northern Ireland instead. Yeah. Um, so the, I'm always struck by the tight co-movement between house prices in Ireland, North and South. and just given the different monetary authorities responsible there. So question was, and given both of you have perhaps had um, overseen some of that, so just why do you think there has been that so strong co-movement despite very different monetary policies at times? And does that give us anything to think about in terms of maybe optimal currency areas and uh, for, for, uh, for Northern Ireland and wh where it might uh, sit? I think that the, um, the bank lending for housing, that, it was all part and parcel of a movement which was in the United States and also in Britain uh, for a, a very expansive approach to, to uh, residential mortgages. So, uh, in fact, the same mistakes were being made in Britain just on a scale, a much smaller scale. If, if the scale of the, both the price but especially the amount of construction had been smaller and commensurate. What happened in Britain was that probably prices went up. There wasn't that much construction. There was some, but there wasn't that much. If the, if the scale was smaller, the losses would have been absorbable by the, the uh, equity holders who did take uh, a bath. Uh, and, you know, maybe with a little bit of, of, of fiscal support, it wouldn't have been a huge, huge crisis. So, so actually it was the same kind of banking behavior. And I would say that if it hadn't been going on in Britain and in the United States at the same time, People would have been juggling the Irish regulators. Say, you better do something because your banks are going mad. Because it's easy for the Irish banks to say, well, we, Royal Bank of Scotland, they're doing the same. Uh, 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 HBOS, they're doing the same. Uh, American Bank, you know, what are you talking about? We know what we're doing. Ooh, we're getting market share. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure the monetary policy com comes into it, really. In fact, uh, interest rates were low generally, but, you know, 
That, that was, it was the banking practice. From a, a, it's part of, we have such huge links across between Ireland and Britain, and part of it is that cultural link, and you see, well, oh, they're doing it there, it's okay, we'll do it here. I, I, I'll just add to that. I think it's important to realize that there are things other than monetary policy that drive asset prices. And I think a key ingredient uh, in the run-up to the financial crisis was just the, the benign environment, the very low volatility, what's referred to as the great moderation. And that basically makes people um, much more inclined to take out more loans. They become more insouciant uh, to risk. And that was a general feature in many environments. Um, Uh, well, well, no, well, no, but I, I mean, the, the things you, you, I mean, you have to remember, uh, as Patrick said, that there was, um, uh, you know, aggressive uh, lending in the UK, but not as uh, aggressive as there was in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, on top of that, in the, in the, in the, for Northern Ireland, you have to remember, actually, the climate was getting better because of the, the better political uh, situation there and so forth, and things were sort of normalizing, and that was making it more attractive for businesses to locate in Northern Ireland. And of course, people can live one side of the border and work on the other. It's, you know, it, it is very much a, uh, a single market area. Whenever I used to go over to Northern Ireland to talk to businesses over there, they were always focused on what was happening uh, in the south. It wasn't what was happening uh, in the mainland that was uh, the primary issue for them. Um, anyway, there's uh, a couple still in the back row. Thank you. Uh, Steve Nash, I'm a senior policy advisor at Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Um, my question is, um, Ireland had a, an advantage in that it has a very efficient tax system, it has a very professional tax authority, and there was headroom to raise taxes when the crisis hit. But at the same time, the public sector was blamed for the crisis to a large extent, that's how it appeared here. And there were large uh, pay cuts, 20% pay cuts, and large cuts to public sector pensions at the same time. Do you think on reflection that uh, too big a hit was taken by the public sector for a crisis not of its making? I'm, I'm reluctant to get into this blame issue. Um, I think you do have to turn the clock back a little bit earlier and see the trend of, of pay rates in different parts as well. So that's part of the story. Uh, I think there has been, I think, uh, uh, some, some journalists, some newspapers, I'd say, rather than journalists, because sometimes the news, <laughs> journalist writes one thing and the newspaper says the other, uh, had at a certain point taken a very, very hostile approach to the public sector and demonize the public sector in a way that is, is, is quite wrong and, and, and unreasonable. And I think you make a very interesting point about the ability of the Irish tax system, which was really professionalized during the 1980s, and, 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 and it's a really, really uh, professional and efficient public uh, tax revenue collector, and it had the capacity to turn up that dial and raise huge quantities of money very quickly. Now, did the, what about the, the uh, exact schedule of, of income tax um, actually, I uh, have another chart which I sometimes show, which shows very interestingly that although the tax, income tax schedule is a lot higher now than it was in the boom, it's more or less the same as it was in 1997, which was, I, I know that's a long time ago, but it was a great year. Everything was in balance. And it, you know, it was, it, it, it's a time where you say, if we had, everything was going right. The growth was high, the balance of payments was okay, the fiscal was okay, and the tax rates, income, so we managed to do a lot of stuff with these high levels of income tax, which are now considered high because people are still saying, can I get, can I get back to 2007? No, you can't. Uh, okay, um, one more in the back row, and then I'm afraid the final question will have to be the man in the blue shirt. And apologies to the, uh, the rest of you. Hi, um, Andy Bruce, Reuters. Um, I'd just like to ask you about your successor, Philip Lane, and um, I wondered if you could tell us if he agrees with the mortgage restrictions you've introduced and uh, where his views might lie on ECB policy. Thank you. <laughs> That's the easy question to answer. Ask it. Yes. Um, well, we'll have to see. Um, so some people said Tweedledum and Tweedledee because they're both 
professors from Trinity College, so they must be the same, and they've written papers together, so they must be the same. And, um, but I'm sure when he starts on, on Thursday morning of next week, he'll have a big broom, and he'll be sweeping out things and starting new things. Uh, so uh, beyond that, you didn't expect me to answer anything. <laughs> He's a great guy. Okay, and uh, the final question. No, 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 here. Yeah. Good evening, Governor. My name is Toyan Dimov. I work in financial services. And my question is, what do you think the, the significance is of uh, the U.S. The US uh, quantitative easing and uh, foreign direct investment within uh, Ireland? Because, as we all know, that the, the U.S. and Ireland have had a very long relationship, and the U.S. multinational firms have used Ireland as a platform for investment within Europe, uh, for exports within uh, both Europe and the U in the U.K. Well, how do you think this recovery in, in the U.S. has influenced the the decrease in Ireland's debt as well as I its own recovery? Thank you. No, I, I think uh, you know, U.S., U.K., the, these are differences between the Irish economy and the rest of the euro area. We have more uh, in involvement and exposure to those economies, and the more rapid recovery of both economies has, has been important. As far as QE is concerned, uh, well, I suppose you mean the low interest rate environment, low for long interest rate environment that has prevailed in the United States for some time. Undoubtedly, that has uh, made funds available to um, uh, various uh, it, it, it's made it possible for various funds to access cheap resources to invest eventually when they recovered confidence in Irish property, in distressed property, in distressed loans, and they're coming in and they've bought a lot of stuff. And they've taken it off the hands of the banks and off the hands of the, the government's asset management agency. And uh, this has certainly speeded, it, it, it builds on itself. It's, you say, well, if those people are prepared to buy these, uh, these uh, assets. Maybe these assets are good. Maybe the economy is going to recover. So I think it's been, it has had a, a favorable impact. Uh, so that sort of private equity coming in to, to take off. I remember early on people say, oh, where, who's going to buy this stuff? Who's going to buy this stuff? And I said, there's a big world out there. Now, it took three years for that big world to regain confidence in Ireland. And, and then they came. And they're still coming. And uh, whatever people might say, and I, you know, say, okay, so this is this has benefited some people and not other people. But if we didn't take those steps and we didn't move fast, we'd still be waiting for those guys to come, and we'd still be waiting for the recovery and waiting for the jobs. Okay, thank you very much. Apologies again for those of you who didn't get uh, to ask your question, but I'm afraid it's well past eight o'clock when we're supposed to. Uh, finish. I want to thank Patrick again for a, a fantastic lecture and being for so forthcoming uh, uh -oh. to the questioning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and will you please join me in thanking him once again? <laughs>